Hey, folks, I want to welcome everyone uh, to our another webinar series. This is Joe Anderson, Certified Financial Planner, President here at Pure Financial Advisors. We have a really special guest today, uh, Professor Jamie Hopkins. He's an um, incredible leader in our industry, and we're really privileged uh, to have him. We, he's a professor at the American College. The American College, for those of you that don't know, is where uh, certified financial planners like myself get educated. So he's an advisor to the top advisors or a teacher, professor to the top advisors here in the country. Um, I wanted to get Jamie on because he's done terrific work in regards to home equity for a retirement income. I know a lot of individuals now need every dollar that they can possibly scrounge up to have a successful retirement. So we're doing something a little bit different. We're not talking stocks, bonds, taxes. What we're getting into is using some of the home equity as a retirement income source. So without further ado, I want to welcome Jamie, and um, I'm just going to turn it over to him, and I'm going to let him go through this, and um, we'll um, answer any questions that you have. You can always ask us questions at info at purefinancial.com. Jamie, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, take it away, my friend. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction, Joe, and for the great work you're doing, and thanks for having me in today uh, to kind of, as you said, uh, speak on something that's a little bit different than kind of your stocks, your investments. Uh, we're going to be talking about home equity as a retirement income source. I'm going to go over some of the strategies that are out there, uh, some things that you might just want to be asking yourself when we're thinking about our home and where are we going to live in retirement, how are we going to use this home, and uh, a little bit of the research that's out there too, which I think is interesting because it might be able to help you kind of reconsider your situation and what you're going to do moving forward. So I have just a real quick agenda here of what I want to cover, and hopefully we can uh, get through all of this and you, you'll be thinking differently when we're done with it. So the first part is uh, Joe gave a great introduction of what the American College is and who we are. I'm just going to briefly tell you about that. I'm going to tell you about why do we have this, uh, you know, really this webinar, this new focus on home equity, and some really interesting uh, tidbits there. We're then going to talk, what's your situation feel like? What does it look like? You know, what are some questions you need to ask yourself about where you're living, your home equity, uh, your retirement? How does that fit into a comprehensive plan? Then I will talk about some home equity income strategies. How can we actually take that home and make it work for you in retirement? How can it support your other strategies? How can it support your lifestyle, your goals? Because it really is all goal-based planning. There's not necessarily a, a, a one correct right strategy. That's the only one we're going to go with. There's a variety of strategies, and we just need to think about home equity as as kind of a another tool on the, in that toolbox or toolkit, however it's uh, being described. But it's, it's an asset, and we need to think about it as such. And then again, at the end, we'll have the ability to answer questions. Uh, you know, from from Joe's side, uh, we'll kind of wrap it up at that point. So who is the American College? You know, where, where do I come from? Why should you be listening to me at all? Well, we are a, a nonprofit accredited college. We go through the same accreditation as Princeton, as UPenn, as Villanova. Why did I mention those three? Because they're all in our general area. Um, we're right outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That's our location where we're located, our campus. Uh, we've been around for about 90 years, so we're not new. We've been teaching financial service professionals that entirety of the 90 years. That is our goal, is to educate the advisors, um, which really should be trickling down you know, to the consumers and helping them out too. So what's kind of our priorities here at the college? Well, really, education is our number one priority. We teach retirement planning. We teach CFP. Uh, you know, so the advisors that are kind of the best advisors, they come to us to get their education. We do a lot of research out of the American College also. We have an extensive video library that's free that's available in case you want to look up a topic. It's also on YouTube, so again, I think that's how most people find things today as you Google a topic, but you can find a lot of our videos on YouTube. Uh, actually, I think we're nearing a thousand consumer videos out there on different retirement issues, so a lot of information out there. Uh, we also do a lot in kind of thought leadership impacting uh, what's happening in D.C., on state laws, on tax laws. So we really are kind of at the forefront of this retirement issue of the financial planning issue. So, you know, that's kind of where we are as a college, what we're doing, our mission. 
as I said, we are a nonprofit. Uh, this, but there's a little photo of me up here, so at least you you can put a face to the name now. And then that's uh, my co-director here at the college, uh, David Littell, was an Olympic fencer. Um, his dad lived to 103, and it's actually one of the reasons I always keep David up on my slides is. Uh, you know, not to, to share the light with him, but to use him as an example. And I always want to talk about his dad was 103. And you just want to think about that when you start thinking about longevity, when you think about retirement planning and where are you going to be living. His dad needed, uh, you know, a place to live to 103. And so it, it's important where are we are going to live? How are we going to fund our retirement? And, you know, there's probably people uh, listening to this webcast, webinar at some point that are also going to live well past 100. And so that, you know, that's a real challenge. How do we manage that, that longevity in our life? Well, you know, as I said, it's going to be a little bit different because this webinar, we're going to be talking about home equity. Now, when we're talking about your home, you, you probably have a sense of pride. You probably have happiness. You probably have emotions and feelings tied to it. The home is not a purely financial situation. It, it is a lot to do about your enjoyment, right? And as I always say, you know, when people say, when you go buy a home, what's the three things? It's not, you know, finances, finances, finances. It's location, location, location. It's something different. It's personal. It's not just about the money. But we can't ignore that either. And when I say we can't ignore that, especially when we're talking about retirement planning, when we're talking about financial planning, comprehensive planning, why? Well, when we look at home equity, and this is, you know, pretty good data. Now, these numbers have both probably gone up a little bit since. Uh, but the last U.S. Census data, uh, 2008, they looked at across the U.S. and said, well, where is kind of home ownership? How much equity do people have in their home? And what about all those other financial assets they have? Where, where is America? And what we saw was that the average 65-year-old couple, right? So this is, you know, moving into retirement or already in retirement. This is the breakdown of the average person. Two-thirds of their wealth are going to be in their home equity, and about a third of their wealth are going to be in other uh, non-equity assets. So then we're talking about the IRA, 401K, and that's pretty accurate. I think today that's gone up about $8,000 there in the non-equity. We're closer to $100,000. Um, but again, still the kind of percent to home equity or other assets, pretty even. Now, this might not be your situation, right? You might have a lot more in uh, kind of your 401k, IRA, other assets, and this does not include Social Security. Uh, usually, we don't list Social Security as an asset, but we might list it as a retirement income source, so a little bit different there. But still, what this demonstrates is just how big uh, of an issue your home equity is, how much of your wealth is often in there. Even if we flip this and it was a third of your wealth, still shouldn't be ignored, right? And, and how are we going to use this wealth? How are we going to use the value of your home to, to meet your standard of life, your quality of life? Housing is crucial. And it's not just the money in your house, but it's where you're living and, and that quality of life. Housing is usually not a good investment, you know, if we're kind of comparing it to securities, stocks, bonds. But what we're really doing is we're buying housing services and we're automating our savings over our life. And this is what happens. People tend to accumulate a good amount of wealth in their home by the time they're retiring. Now, what's your situation like? right? And these are some of the things. I'm going to use some data points here, but I really want you to think about these questions as we move throughout. So the first one is you know, this, uh, all these are coming from a survey that was done by the American College in 2016, so brand new. Um, you know, up-to-date data here, and it asked a thousand retirees about uh, kind of their uh, home equity and retirement planning. And one of the first things here is that just have you thought about where you want to live in retirement? We see most people, you know, moving into retirement and retirement have thought about that. Now, not everyone, but most people. So, have you thought about where you want to live in retirement? What's your housing is going to be like? Right. That's an important. That's a big decision to to make sure you take care of. Then the next one was we asked, you know, do you want to kind of age in place? Do you want to live in your current home for as long as possible? And this is important because this is a question you have to ask yourself. And what we see is most people, 83% of people say yes, they want to continue to live in their home for as long as possible. And they really expect to age in place, retire in place. They don't want to move. So do you want to move in retirement? That's a big question, right? Do you want to stay in your home? 
Now, I thought a very interesting thing is almost nobody, 5% of respondents in this said they want to leave their home and rent, right? If you're a homeowner, you probably don't want to leave your home and rent. You know, renting, uh, you know, is fine and financially it can often be a good decision. But once you have that emotion and sentimental attachment to a home and you've been a homeowner, it's really hard to kind of imagine yourself leaving that, not owning a home anymore, and just purely renting. So another important thing to ask yourself is, why do you want to have your house kind of at the end of your life, right? Why do you still want to own it? Is it just purely sentimental? Is it because you want to use it as a legacy goal? You want to leave it to your children. And what we saw there is a, a good portion of people, 20% of uh, the individual surveyed said, you know what, yeah, we really do want to leave our home as a legacy asset to our children or heirs. But a good portion said 45%, it's not important at all that they leave the home, and about 35% were indifferent. Now, another important thing is, you know, if we have life insurance in place and, and we are leaving some type of legacy to our children, does it have to be the home or do we just want to give value to our children? Right? It's an important question to ask because if you really do want to leave the family home to your children, some of these, uh, you know, uh, using your home as an income source, some of that comes off the table. If you really do want to leave your home as a legacy, we've got to protect that then and we're not going to be taking significant withdrawals from it in retirement. But if we're okay with just, you know, not having that be tied up as a legacy goal, then have we thought about home equity as an income source in retirement or just throughout your life? What we see is most people have not even considered that. They just haven't considered home equity as a retirement income or income source, actually taking money out of your home to pay other things. Now, what we see here is this becomes more palatable. It becomes more used once we have a good financial plan in place. So you're with an advisor, right? If you're working with an advisor, all of a sudden, it's a little bit easier to start thinking about how to use your home as an income source. If you don't have a plan in place, you know, it's a very scary thing to think about because we don't know how it's going to fit into everything. So we've got to have a good plan in place, and then we can start thinking about how to use this. And so then it says, you know, what's our case study? What do people look like? Well, we see a lot of wealth in the home. We haven't thought about the home as an income source, but we have thought about where we want to live in retirement. We have a good amount of people that say, I want to leave it as a legacy asset, so where do we stand on that? And are we comfortable using our home equity as an income source, right? Those are, you know, part of the questions that we need to ask ourselves. And then, you know, if we want to age in place, can we then start using some of these home equity income solutions to make our quality of life better? And that's really what it's about here, right, is, is making our situation better, using the assets that we have at our disposal that we've taken years to accumulate, this wealth in our home, making sure that we make that work for us. And so here I list out kind of, eight different strategies here and some of them are going to help you age in place and some of them are really going to be if you want to move. So you see kind of the selling the home side over here on the one that we say downsizing. Downsizing is a very traditional uh, kind of retirement strategy. We're going to sell the home, we're going to move somewhere else and we're going to free up some of our home equity and use it on other things. In reality we actually see a lot of uh, you know people who move in retirement they don't you might, they might downsize in the sense of square footage. They rarely downsize in the sense of a less expensive home. We often see, if you're moving in, in retirement, that you, you want amenities. You want a nice home. Maybe you want a new home in a new area. Uh, and, and so are you going to free up home equity? You can, but we don't always see that. So again, if you plan on moving, that can be one decision that you're going to have to go over. Do you want to sell the home and move to a retirement community, a CCRC as I call it, a Continued Care Retirement Community? Very popular in California, Florida, Pennsylvania. We're seeing a lot of building there, more and more people moving in. Again, that's closer to renting at that stage. You're going to sell your home and really kind of rent in a uh, retirement community. Now you might have some ownership rights in there, but closer to renting. I love CCRCs. I, I'd live there if I could. So I, I'm very pro CCRCs. I don't think I'm trying to dissuade people from that here either. Um, do you want to live with your family? Right. That's you know to me is not a good solution. Is it what happens to some people? Absolutely. But that's more of a 
you know, when we don't have other option situations. A sale leaseback arrangement, not hugely popular today, but sometimes it can work. And that's usually what we're talking about. Your children purchase your home from you. You rent it back. So you get kind of the $300,000 home price. And you have that cash. You can use it for things. And you slowly kind of pay them some rental income over time. They own the home, which was your plan to leave it to them anyway. So sometimes that's a strategy if the kids are kind of well off, parents want to age in place. Now, some of the other ways on the other side here, we can actually kind of use our home, continue to live there, and tap into the home equity. Uh, home sharing. We'll talk about this real briefly later on, too. But uh, you know, again, not hugely popular, but that's bringing people into your home, sharing your home, really renting it to other people to use that, uh, you know, what you've kind of built up as value in the home to generate income for you. It's now working as a uh, kind of rental property that you still live in. We'll talk about single purpose loans very briefly because they're different from state to state, but sometimes you can borrow under a special program in your state to get access to your home equity at preferred rates. Uh, we'll talk about a traditional home equity loan uh, and just kind of setting that up and borrowing from your house. Sometimes there we might be talking about refinancing a home. Sometimes there we might be talking about a line of credit against the home and how those can be used. And lastly, and probably our, the one that's most you know, kind of driven to uh, our retirement planning is a reverse mortgage. And as soon as you hear that, you might have a negative reaction. And I, I just want you to, to, to hold off that negative reaction for a couple minutes. And, and, you know, let me tell you how they've changed. The reverse mortgage that we have today is not the reverse mortgage of 10 years ago. It is a very different program. And I will talk about, you know, some of the downsides of reverse mortgages. It's not all good but they can be used very strategically, and they're becoming a very popular tool for financial advisors and retirees. So here, what is the downsizing and kind of moving to that CCRC? Again, as a strategy, it really is we can sell the house, we can free up cash by buying a less expensive house. But as we just saw, uh, you know, most of the data tells us people want to age in place. So that, again, if you ask yourself, do I want to age in place, and the answer is yes. Well, downsizing is kind of off the table because downsizing is going to require you to move out of your home. And as we see, most people don't like renting. Uh, it's probably the same for you. Again, that's something you can ask yourself. But we do see that people who move in retirement tend to be very satisfied with their move. So it's not a big thing of buyer's remorse and regret. So if you decide to downsize and move, we actually see very high satisfaction uh, with that through research. Another one, as I mentioned, home sharing. Now, home sharing, I, I like to say, is kind of the golden girl situation. And that's actually, if, when you look at the stats, fairly uh, accurate. Where we bring in uh, multiple uh, you know, retired women into one home, uh, that's mostly what we see here. There are very few men, uh, as part of the percent, actually using home sharing as a way to tap into their home equity and retirement. But we've got about 4 million women over the age of 50 living uh, with a kind of, you know, non-spouse, non-kind uh, you know kind of uh, relationship-driven housing uh, situation. And that's some data from the AARP. Um, very few men out there. But again, how can you do that? How can this be beneficial? Increase income, decrease expenses. You have some companionship. Uh, there's about 24 uh, different home sharing agencies now. So almost half of our states now have state agencies uh, that can help actually match you up with somebody if you want to go this route. Yeah, not hugely popular today, might grow in popularity over time, but it's there, it's an option. Another one here, this is our kind of traditional line of credit from your home, which we often call a HELOC, home equity line of credit. Now, the research and kind of financial planning aspect of this, if we're talking about retirement, and that's what I want to put this around, that these traditional lines of credit can be very good for you if we're using it for a very short-term expense. We're talking about 12 to 18 months, maybe 24 months, so kind of a year to two years. If we're going to set up this line of credit and maybe draw from it from kind of a two-year period, then pay it back maybe again over another two-year period, it's pretty good. Short-term is really where this is good. And not only that, often, there are a lot of requirements to actually keep this in a fairly short-term situation. So what do you use it for? Well, you need a new roof. 
right? Uh, you need a, you want to put a bathroom in on the first floor. Something like that uh, can be a very good use of this line of credit. There aren't a whole lot of costs to set it up. It's fairly cheap in that regard, and then once you start borrowing from it, you're going to have to start paying it back. And so another alternative here is a strategy that says sometimes debt shifting. You've got a lot of credit card or student loans, and they're higher interest rates than the housing rate is. Well, actually, it might be better to pay off the credit card, pay off the student loan, pay off the personal loan, and flip it over to a, a, you know, a draw against your house at a lower interest rate. And, and that's often a good financial decision. Now, what are some of the downsides of borrowing against your house? Well, it's going to create an outflow of cash. You're going to have to start making monthly payments. A HELOC is not a permanent line of credit. Typically, we have a 10-year limit on it. So we set it up today. In 10 years, the line of credit is going to go away. We might be able to open up a new one. We might not be able to open up a new one. Rates might be significantly different. So you know, it's a temporary line of credit. Sometimes they can even be canceled on you, too. Uh, so it's, you know, there's a little bit more uh, uncertainty about if we'll actually have that line of credit when we need it. If here we don't repay our line of credit, we don't make our monthly payments, we become strapped for cash in retirement, all of a sudden, right, we could go into a foreclosure proceeding and actually lose the house. There's really no extra protection. It's just like paying a traditional mortgage here. We owe all the other fees, costs, insurance, taxes. We don't make them. We could lose the home. And then uh, usually in the first couple years, if we're still in the draw period, you typically pay back interest, not principal. And similar to a traditional mortgage, once you start making payments, often the first couple payments, even after the draw period, are mostly interest and not paying down the principal. But you have the ability to pay it all off if you had the money. Now, single-purpose loans, don't want to spend a lot of time on these because they're, they're difficult to you know, uh, talk about generally because they're all state law programs. The only point I want to make here really is that looking at your specific state, usually we're talking about loans well, over the age of 70, long-term care need, and maybe your finances became a little bit more pressured, you've got some debt. You might want to see, and, and usually you have to go to your local bank and ask them, are you have any like special loans for people over age 70? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, so it's just a, something to look at maybe later down the line. Not hugely popular today, and again, varies from state to state. But often you can have these uh, as a way to borrow against your home, as a mortgage, as a line of credit with very low closing costs. And, uh, you know, maybe just at least fairly uh, market average interest rates, um, but for somebody who has really bad credit might not qualify for a traditional loan, but might be able to qualify for one of these state single purpose loans. Then I get to kind of the, 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 the meatier part of this, which is our reverse mortgage. As I said, you probably have some negative feelings about reverse mortgages because that's most people in the U.S. What is a reverse mortgage? Well, reverse mortgage is a, uh, you know, Really, it's kind of the flip of our traditional mortgage, which is often called a forward mortgage, where we're going to be making monthly payments of cash to the bank for them giving us a lump sum of money to buy the house. Here, we've actually built up the value of the house. Mortgage company is going to give us a lump sum. We're not going to use it to buy the house at this point. Usually, we're using it to, to fund other needs. And then we don't actually pay it back with monthly payments each month. Usually what we do is we kind of let the interest accrue on what we've borrowed, and that'll go against the amount that we didn't take out of our home. Now, you might say, do I want to do that? Well, we're going to get to why this can be a very strategic use. Now, it is backed. The reverse mortgage industry in the United States is backed by insurance from the federal government. So you actually pay into an insurance program. And why is that important? Well, because you can never owe more than the value of your house with a reverse mortgage. It's a very important aspect of reverse mortgage that your children won't owe that, you won't owe it. The most you can ever owe is the amount of the house. That's it. They take the house, they foreclose, they sell it. You don't owe anything more. Now, this is uh, really only available on your principal residence. You must be 62 or over to enter into a reverse mortgage, and that's actually all homeowners, everyone on the title. There's a multiple ways you can get access to the money of your home. A 10-year option, which is just payments for as long as you live in the home. There is a lump sum option. And the line of credit is really where it's at. 
that's the one that can be used strategically, much lower cost to you, and it can help kind of just improve your quality of life, let you live there and age in place. So what were some of the issues with reverse mortgages? Well, one, these have tended to be used as a option of last resort. That's how people have always thought about them. If I run out of all of my other money, I'll use a reverse mortgage. And so what we see is the kind of average age of someone entering into a reverse mortgage is really older than it should be. We really know it's not bad for somebody in their 70s, but these are much more beneficial if we use them up front in retirement. There's been a very negative perception. Some of that has to do with that. Some of it has to do with bad news stories and really what was overly aggressive marketing for a while. It was also allowed for a long time for anyone to use a reverse mortgage. It didn't, we didn't look at their credit. They didn't look at their income. And what started happening? People couldn't make the payments on their house and they were being kicked out. We also had some kind of uh, other issues with uh, the non-borrowing spouse. and We didn't have quite the protections that they needed. And so we've seen a change in that. And I said, they're not the same. Over the last couple years now, last three years, big changes. Government came in and said, look, these aren't being used properly. We've got to change this system and make it better for consumers. The first thing they did is they put a limit on the ability of uh, consumers to take out the full value of the reverse mortgage up front. So they said, you know, that's really not the best thing to do, take out all the money out at once. We're going to put a little bit of a limitation there. They also restructured the mortgage premiums and costs of this. And actually, over, since kind of 2013, they cut the costs in half, which is really significant. They're much closer now to traditional closing costs and fees of any other mortgage. They used to be about twice as much. Now they're much closer to just the regular fees you'd have with any mortgage. Now, uh, they also protected the non-borrowing spouse. This can happen if you have a 62-year-old and you've got a 55-year-old spouse. 55-year-old spouse is not on the, uh, you know, kind of title of the home. That 62-year-old can actually borrow from the home through reverse mortgage, and the 55-year-old can never get kicked out of the house. And that's a big aspect of reverse mortgages is that you can continue living in the house without making payments. They can't ever kick you out if you don't make your reverse mortgage payments. And again, you can never know, owe more than your home. Can you still get kicked out of your home? There are some very unique circumstances where that can happen. It's if you don't make your uh, property and insurance kind of tax payments. Now, what happened with that? 2015, government said, you know what, we're tired of people getting kicked out of their home for any reason. So what we're going to do now is require a financial assessment of any reverse mortgage that is done. And so what this says is we look at your credit, we look at your income, we look at other debts that you have, and we figure out can you meet your tax and insurance payments each year. If you cannot meet your tax and insurance payments each year and you still want to enter into a reverse mortgage, what we're going to do is we're going to take a piece of the reverse mortgage and we're going to sit it over to the side. We're not going to give you access to it. So let's just say you had access to $200,000 of your home. They're going to take $100,000, sit it off on the side and say, we're going to hold that over here. Now, we're not going to start charging you any interest rates or anything like that, but we're going to use that to pay your property taxes and insurance payments because we don't want you to get kicked out of this home. So we're going to set aside money for that. And so really what they've done is they're not going to allow people, you know, they're taking away some of the risk here for people to ever lose their home. Because the goal here is for you to live in that home, not make payments, and not worry about ever being kicked out. Even if you have no more money, even if the house is worth way less than the debt you owe on it. Now, uh, you know, I want to mention right here, there's two big misconceptions about reverse mortgages. One is when to use them in retirement. And again, this came from a uh, knowledge survey we did this past year about home equity and retirement. We said, when should you use home equity in retirement? And most people said at the end. Well, our research has shown us for years now it's not the best place to use it. It's much better to use it up front to support some other home equity initiatives. And the other thing is here, with a reverse mortgage, your heirs don't have to pay anything above the value of the house. So if your debt is $500,000 and your home's worth $400,000, guess what happens? Bank takes the home. That's it. Nobody owes that additional $100,000.
great aspect of reverse mortgages that takes that risk off the family member. And that's why that insurance program exists from the federal government to make sure if the house does go underwater, there's insurance money to pay it so the bank doesn't get on stuff kind of on the hook there with a big loss either because we want banks in this market providing uh, reverse mortgage reverse mortgages to consumers. Now, I'm going to, there's kind of 10 questions here, these knowledge check questions. We don't really need to do them. Uh, they are available up online at the American College website. If you want to test your kind of reverse mortgage knowledge when you're done this uh, webinar, you could go there. Uh, but we're not going to cover them right now. I kind of went over the top two. So then I want to say, how do we actually use a reverse mortgage? Well, the first one is just start talking about it with your financial advisor, right? You're not going to know if you want to use one by the time you're done listening to this webinar. But at least I want you to think I should have an open mind about my home equity and have these discussions with somebody and see how it fits into my plan. Now, one of the strategies that's often used out there is let's say we're retiring, maybe voluntary or involuntarily, your financial advisor and you've probably read this before too, that we want to defer Social Security as long as we can. It just is a very good math thing. It just tells us you know, deferring Social Security usually works out. It's a good strategy. So if that's our strategy, we want to defer, but we don't have other income sources, sometimes we can go, we can get an eight-year payment from the reverse mortgage company from age 62 to 70. We can defer our Social Security, and then we just need to figure out, well, you know, what did it cost us to do that, and what benefit do we get? And often, at least with today's interest rates, we see that's actually, again, beneficial. It's beneficial if you have a long life expectancy to even use a reverse mortgage to defer Social Security. Now, obviously, if we can, I'd much rather just be able to uh, defer Social Security and not withdraw from my home. But if I don't have that option and I need income, that's an option. We call it a bridge to Social Security. The line of credit is really where it's at. Um, you set that up beginning of retirement, and it keeps growing. We set that up at 62. That line of credit is based off our initial home value, but then it just keeps growing at basically 5 to 6% a year. It's no longer growing at what our house is you know, appreciating at. And so really what we've done there, we've diversified our home. Our home is like one, having all of your investments in one stock. By getting a line of credit, we now really have split that to kind of two stocks, that we have one that grows at a fixed rate and one that grows at a more variable rate. And that's a good thing. What we've done there is we've really diversified our situation uh, and, and can be very beneficial. Now, we can also use this as cash flow management. Typically, how it's done today is you might have a small mortgage going into retirement. You have another 10 years of payment. You might say, well, you know, on my new income from my Social Security and my 401k, I can't afford to make all those payments and still live in my home, but I want to live in my home. So one thing I could do is I could get a reverse mortgage to pay off the traditional mortgage, and then really my payments are going to be, come from my accumulated home equity. But I won't have that cash flow leaving each month to the bank. Uh, next one here is going to be, uh, you know, kind of, what are some of the things we can use it for? And a big one that financial advisors are going to use, of course, this third one on this slide, spend home equity to mitigate sequence of returns risk. And I think this is incredibly important and really the most beneficial way to use a reverse mortgage. We go in at 62, we set up the line of credit. really doesn't cost us much to set that up. Why are we doing that? We're doing that because we now can borrow from that when the markets are down. We get another 2008. Markets drop 40%. Do you want to sell your stocks when they're down 40%? We know we don't want to do that that year, right? Everyone knows that that is the wrong thing to do. But what can we do instead? Well, we could borrow from our house at you know, today's rates at 4%. We could do that if we already set up that line of credit. And if we didn't have the market drop, well, then we just leave it alone. We don't borrow. So we're not accumulating any debt in that situation. That's the most strategic way to use a reverse mortgage. It's great. It can make your portfolio last a much longer period of time. So it's something to look at, right? Think about the line of credit. Talk to your advisor about it. See if it fits into your situation. We can also use your home equity right to do things like Roth conversions. 
we can manage your tax bracket because borrowing from your home is not taxable income because there's a debt that's due on the side of it. So it's not going to increase your taxes. It's not going to increase your tax bracket. So we can manage taxes here. We can use it as a contingency fund, right? We can use it to maybe pay for some long-term care costs if we're receiving them at home. So a lot of good strategies around reverse mortgages today, they're not the same reverse mortgage they were 10 years ago, even five years ago. It's a different program today, a lot more protections for consumers, and a lot more research about the best ways to use a reverse mortgage to use home equity. So just kind of wrapping up here, I want to say, you know, continue to stay educated. You're watching this, you're doing the right thing. But read about reverse mortgages. Talk to your financial advisor, talk to your planner about reverse mortgages, home equity, right? That's how you get involved. You educate yourself and then you have a conversation about it. And then, you know, my last thing is just start thinking about your home, about this home equity as a potential income source. That, you know, we have too many people that just leave all of that assets, all of that money kind of held hostage for housing. But we can tap into that and still use the home in the way that we probably want to. We want to live there, and we can use it and tap into that home equity at the same time. So uh, last two points from me, and then I'm just going to pass it over to Joe, who will wrap up, is uh, if you're interested in some of these topics around retirement income planning and, and want to buy something that's not very expensive, we have, I have two e-books out there, one on kind of retirement risk. Both of these are within the last year. They've been published with Forbes. Um, they're available Kindle, iTunes, Amazon, uh, but there's one on retirement risk and one about kind of a 10-step retirement process, which will probably fit in very nicely with, with, with what your advisors do because it's something that we teach CFP students, um, CFP advisors, and uh, other retirement income specialists. So, But it's kind of this is more for the uh, consumer level. Again, if you can just search my name out there, you can usually find these. And I uh, just want to thank Joe and thank everyone here who was able to watch this. And uh, hopefully it just changed your thought process a little bit. Think about things a little bit differently that you might not have thought about before. Hey, Jamie, I want to thank you very much for taking some time. And if everyone, um, we'll put some links on our website uh, to guide you to more information about this. Um, and for those e-books, we will pick up the cost for anyone that's watching this uh, webinar uh, so we want to make sure that you are informed. Uh, Jamie's a great resource uh, to the financial services community, um, and we want to make sure that you guys get the education that you need to make really good decisions. Hopefully this um, brought some spark to your minds of uh, some different ideas that you might have had in regards to your home equity in creating income. Um, there's a lot of cool tax strategies that you can implement. Uh, sequence of return risk is a big deal. The markets are at all-time highs, as we all know. We've had a good bull run. Uh, but as you're approaching retirement, a bear market can definitely hurt your overall income strategy. So taking a look at different safe measures is really key in an overall retirement strategy. Uh, if you have any questions, um, talk to your financial advisor here at Pure Financial Advisors. Um, for without uh, further ado, we'll get the heck out of here. Jamie, I want to thank you again, my friend, and hopefully you enjoyed this webinar, and we will see you the next time around. Have a great day, everyone.